Drummond Reed. I am co-founder and CEO of uh, Respect Network. Um, and when we use that term, uh, I'm speaking of Respect Network Corporation. We are the umbrella organization for what's now 73 founding partner companies uh, that are cooperating together, not only to bring you this network, but this launch tour. This is our uh, third stop. As Annalise said, we uh, first began in London two weeks ago and then in San Francisco last week. And the goal of my talk here today is to, uh, as quickly as I can, uh, give you a, a, a picture of what this new network is about. Um, it's, it's, you, you've heard this talk about how we're now going to be connecting personal clouds and business clouds in a new trust network. I want to make it as concrete as I can what we really mean by that and give you a couple very specific examples. Might be an extra slide in there, yes. Um, so that uh, you leave this, this room going, okay, I, I see that there's, you know, this is gonna go, uh, it's gonna go places none of us can be certain, but you know where it's starting and you know what we're, uh, you know, what we're aiming for and you have some concrete examples of what you're gonna start doing with this network as an individual and what you would start doing with this network as a company because it is for both people and businesses. We talk about personal clouds all the time because that's a major innovation, but that's because business clouds are already here today. And what we're introducing is this capability for personal and business clouds to connect in a trusted uh, manner to unleash all kinds of new value. So I'm gonna start out by talking about a very simple new button we call it the login with respect button, and that's in contrast to login with um, some other buttons that you're probably very familiar with out there. Uh, so this, uh, these set of buttons are probably very familiar, and I'll do a quick test here. Uh, how many folks here are on a major social network? Just a quick show of hands. Okay. Now, how many of you use these social login buttons regularly when you go to a website to log in? All right. There's a set of hands, but notice it was about half of the number of hands that went up initially. What's fascinating about these buttons, they have become very popular, okay? Facebook has the uh, leads in the market share, a little over 51% of the social login buttons out there. And it's uh, estimated uh, by Gartner that by the end of this year, uh, more than half of the major consumer-facing websites in the world will have social login buttons. And there's a really good reason for it, okay? Um, with a with social login button, there we go. Okay, no username and password, remember. No form to fill out. <clears throat> um, whenever you return to the site, after you've initially signed up, it's just a single click to log in, okay? And it just works. The clicker doesn't just work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's all, it's all cloud. You don't need a special software to install. Everything just works in the cloud, and it's the magic of all these social login buttons. So if, with all of those advantages, why are we coming to, uh, try it again. Why are we moving into a situation now where major sites, like the New York Times, have removed the login with Facebook button? Why is the use of these social login buttons actually declined by 14% over the last year? So the reasons are, quickly to step through them, people don't actually understand what permissions they're giving when they click that button. They don't trust what's gonna happen with their data when uh, it's being shared by, uh, from a social networking account. They're not really sure what the privacy is of that. <clears throat> They don't want a middleman in their, in their relationships, understanding all of their login behavior and connections with other sites. And lastly, some people have actually stopped to consider that every time you use that social login button, you're creating a, a, a login, a relationship that if you leave that social network, they're all gone, okay? And you think, well, that's never, I'm never gonna stop using Facebook you may actually have no choice. There's a wonderful article online by a reporter that was kicked off of Facebook. He never could find out why because one of the uh, Facebook terms of service is if they find a reason that they need to uh, uh, turn off your account, they do not have to tell you why. You don't own that account, they do. So these are all part of, of, of what's, you know, the reasons that that's been declining. We're now gonna say, okay, so what, if we can give you a button, okay, would be right there, right where you'd see those social login buttons, where when you click that button, you knew that you were gonna create a completely private connection from your own personal cloud, okay? 
where, where if you have a magic clicker, <laughs> all the data that you share using that button is going to be entirely under your permission, and you can revoke that permission at any time because it's stored at your personal cloud. Where the connection you're creating, you know, is always yours because it's with a personal cloud for which the network you're on guarantees you the right of portability of that cloud from any service provider where you can host it yourself for life, okay? And lastly, where all the information you're sharing is covered not just by a privacy policy from that other site, but by a global trust agreement that every member of this network has entered into, okay? Now, quick show of hands. How many of you would use that button? That's, that's what we're after. <laughs> that's why we're building this network, okay? Oh, there's the button. It appears. <laughs> so to power that button, we need a new kind of network, okay? Uh, we need a network that obviously is constructed differently than the networks behind these other. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing. It's like, you know, magical, magical slides here. So uh, we need a new kind of network. And what I'm going to do here quickly, and if you were at the Immersion Day last night, you'll see some of these same slides, and some of them are on our site. But over the last three years, we've learned how do we quickly explain what is fundamentally different about this new network that we're building, Respect Network. So let's hold this up. Here. Yes. And again, all of these buttons are powered by a network. That's what makes them possible. So what I want to show you is what is different about this network. I'm going to start here, OK? It's a very simple picture if you want to imagine the architecture of the centralized social networks, whether it's Facebook or, <laughs> or LinkedIn or any of the others. A single company aggregates all the data, okay? Doesn't matter if it takes tens of, of, of thousands of servers at Facebook or Google, it's one company. One company has <clears throat> um, sets all the terms on that and they monetize it to their benefit, okay? So fundamentally, if you want to build a network that's based on privacy and respect for personal data, you have to start with a completely different picture that emerges there, okay? If you're going to do privacy by design, the first and most important element is every person and every business on that network has to have their own private data. You can't centralize it and give some other entity permission over it if it's going to be private, okay? So you end up with a network that, uh, where every person, every business has their own private cloud. This is not actually, even though it's a much more complex picture than it looks like over there, this is actually the picture of what the global banking network looks like, the global credit card network looks like, the ATM networks. Networks designed for broad scale trust uh, globally, that's what they do. They're decentralized networks, and then all the nodes create peer-to-peer -peer connections. So there is no centralization of the data. <clears throat> now, on this new cloud infrastructure, um, as I said, business clouds are fairly well established. What's really new here and why we keep talking about them are personal clouds. But when we say personal clouds, we're not talking iCloud, as you're getting it from Apple today, or Dropbox or Google Drive. That's, you know, that's a start. That's a step in the right direction. But how many folks here are Dropbox users? And how many are Google Drive users? OK. And all of you are aware that uh, Dropbox doesn't talk to Google Drive, right? And, you know, and then we can talk about iCloud. And, and, and all of those are proprietary systems for, share, for storing and sharing data in the cloud. <clears throat> what we're talking about here with Respect Network is the same step that the internet went through and that email went through, open standards. We need a, a, a single interoperable way to connect personal clouds. And we also need um, the, the infrastructure so that this is truly yours. I've got news for you. Your Apple iCloud doesn't really belong to you. The data, they'll say, yeah, yeah, OK, you, know, you can store anything you want there. But can you take it someplace else? Can you click a button and move it someplace else? No. There isn't a solution for that today. There are still walled gardens. They're getting larger, they're getting richer, but they're still walled gardens. So what we're trying to build here with Respect Networks, open standard personal clouds. And that means that if you want to connect them, you need an open standard way to do that. And Doc talked to here about the XDI protocol. I've co-chaired the XDI Technical Committee at OASIS, one of the three major standard bodies for the internet, for 10 years and four months now. 
That's how long we've been working on what you need to do what we call semantic data interchange. I'll boil it down here for the purpose of this presentation in just this simple point. It's a, it's a standard way to both share data, whether it's structured or binary, and to do secure messaging, all using what are called uh, semantic graphs. This is not markup languages. This is moving to semantic descriptions of information back and forth between the clouds. And we, we call it secure because, of course, once you've standardized how the, the, that graph, you can then standardize how it's encrypted. Doesn't mean that all the connections are using the same uh, security. That's, that's part of the uh, benefit, as you hear shortly here, that you can have different security on different peer-to-peer uh, um, -peer connections. But it means there's one standard way to connect them all, and most importantly, one standard way to provide, describe those permissions called link contracts. So uh, Andy will talk a little bit more about this, Andy Dale, our CTO, and the hackathon going on next door after uh, these sessions, they'll go deep down into it. So we're happy to talk to you about that, but I'm going to keep this at the level of that's the technology layer of this internet, <coughs> I mean of this new network. As significant as that is, it's not the major innovation. More, more importantly, let's talk about the legal layer you need for this network. Over here, once again, the model is very simple. One company sets their terms and conditions. Last I looked, for example, from Apple, it was 89 pages. And how many people have even read one of those 89 pages? No, seriously, tell me, have you ever read? Ah, Annalie, I see a couple hands. Yes. I'm a lawyer, so I'm boring. There you go, there you go. I love the statistic that, uh, uh, I think it was Epic that came up with it, that if, if people actually read the terms and conditions that they're agreeing to, it basically takes 300 years of your life, okay? So we all know about those asymmetric or contracts of adhesion. Um, obviously, on a network design for mutual trust, we had to take a completely different approach. So the first thing we produced as a company in conjunction with the very first founding partners was the Respect Trust Framework. Some people are calling it a digital constitution or a Magna Carta for personal data. Yes, it could be all of those things. I love the fact, by def, you know, and, and by my own personal assistance, there is a one-page summary of that. Lawyers hate summaries. They absolutely hate them. We said, great, you must make one here. We must have this summarized in one page. And I love it uh, with a little bit of work on alliteration. Um, we got it down to one sentence. <laughs> Seriously, there are five core principles of the Respect Trust Framework for personal data, okay? It's a promise among every member of the network to every other member, that's a contractual agreement, that all data will be used by permission. That when data is shared with you as a member, you will protect it. That all members agree that data is portable. When data is shared with you, you're not going to lock it in, okay? If you're a cloud service provider on the network, you must agree that someone can move their entire cloud to another provider. And lastly, that you will provide proof that you are complying with, uh, with the, these five principles. Now, that was the hardest P to come up with, because what do we actually mean by proof? Well, it's not that complicated. What we mean is reputation system. We all actually are using reputation systems on the net every day, and these companies have actually uh, made them the backbone of, of you know, tremendous commercial successes. The idea we had three and a half years ago was, wait a minute, on this network of peers, we could have a reputation system that was simply about trust. How trustworthy is another person or another business on the network to comply with these five principles? It's not rocket science. It just needs to be done and baked in at, at the level of the agreement that every member of the network has. When you sign up for a cloud name, and by the end of today, uh, we want to make sure every one of you has, you're agreeing to the Respect Trust Framework. I actually saw a tweet from uh, Steve uh, Locksnap this year <clears throat> that um, there is a, only one principle in that whole trust framework that's important enough that we called it out. So you don't just say, I agree with respect trust framework. You say, I agree with respect trust framework. And it's one person, one account, one account rule. And I'm happy. I don't want to go into detail right now. But the reason for that is it's to protect the integrity of that reputation system. 
you have one vote, one uh, account to have one piece of feedback for any other member that you have a relationship with to, to affect their reputation. All the members cooperate in, in ensuring that, and that's how you stop the number one attack on reputation systems called the Sybil attack. <clears throat> so we've designed a reputation system here as the fifth principle, so the whole network can cooperate, every person in every business, on enforcing the trust that we're trying to build in this network. All of that said, I would challenge you that there's still an even more important innovation behind this network, and that's the business model. Now, once again, I don't think I have to spend any time explaining the business model of a centralized network. I will just posit this. It is fundamentally opposed to privacy. It's not just the centralization of data. If your business model is to learn more and more about the users of the network, in order to advertise to them or broker their data, then you're always going to have the tension. There's no solution that those the companies that build around that model can come up with ultimately for, for privacy. On this side of the picture, we had no choice. Advertising is not an option here on a network where all the data is private and shared over peer-to-peer -peer connections. Data brokering, at least as we know it today, is also not, not an option. Everything's used by uh, permission. Whole new forms of permission-based data brokering, where you're actually aggregating data in order to serve a customer, that is certainly a new possibility. <clears throat> but fundamentally, we had to say, this network has to be member-supported. Well, how is that going to work? Well, it turns out, especially in the, in the era of financial services, there's a very well-established model for what a member-supported network looks like. If we take the major credit card networks as an example, they allow people and businesses to have trusted private financial relationships. Now, in order to enable that, they use another party called a bank. On the credit card networks, banks are the legal members of the network. They have contracts with individuals. They have contracts with uh, businesses. But fundamentally, uh, the banks are the members of the network. And the business model is very simple. When an individual transacts with a merchant, that merchant, when they join the network, said, I'm going to pay an interchange fee, a small, amount of, uh, a small percentage of that transaction. That goes to the network. The network distributes part of that to the bank that was involved in facilitating that transaction. And in most modern credit cards, a little bit goes back to you, the individual, as a reward. It's very sustainable. Uh, it's, it's powering a network that's actually larger than Facebook. And it, 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 uh, it, I mean, it's not perfect, but it, it works on a trusted basis across the entire world today. So we said when we were starting this, how can we take that same model and apply it to a, a member-supported uh, network for sharing data? Once again, people and businesses, that's what we're enabling here. The Respect Network, don't think it's all about just personal clouds. It's about enabling this trusted relationship. <clears throat> so on this network, um, you still have a service provider that's working with you, the cloud service provider for an individual. Whether you're uh, hosting in the cloud or you're hosting yourself, you're still registering through one. So that's the equivalent of what the bank would be. But what's happening on this network, we're not facilitating fi financial transactions. We're facilitating trusted relationships. Anything that these two parties might want to do over their peer-to-peer -peer connection, we're just enabling that connection and enabling the trust behind it. <clears throat> so when you think about it, we're enabling, uh, we're providing people with a way to provide permission for access to their personal cloud and companies a way to say, I'm going to respect that data. I'm going to respect having that, that uh, uh, private connection. The result is we're building trust. The network is all about building trust. Every person, every business that joins this network is going to help build a trust network. So the business model, again, uh, if we said that connection, this, this new form of trusted private connection with the individual has real value to businesses, just like that value that the interchange fee that they pay <clears throat> for, a, 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 um, for a financial transaction. The difference here is since we're not just talking about money, we're talking about the value of that relationship, then the split is very different. In the Respect Business Framework that we published two weeks ago at our launch, we said a third of that will go to the network of that relationship fee value. A third will go to the cloud service provider to help underwrite your cloud services. 
and a third goes to you. You, the individual that are the source of that value, will see a third of the value of any company that you connect to out there. And when we say, well, how do you know what that is? We're surfacing it, just like Google AdWords are an open market mechanism for the value of an AdWord, we're saying there's a value in a relationship. The company you're connecting to will tell you. You will know right there how much is my relationship at any one period of time valued by a particular company. And a third of that value will be flowing right in to your personal cloud. That's the business model that we think can sustain this network just as sustainable, for example, as the global credit card networks. <clears throat> So uh, I'll wrap up here by quickly, um, uh, again, I wanted to make it very tangible for you what this network is like in the form of the button, the new button that we are uh, out to, to deliver. <clears throat> and the goal of our launch here is we're starting a crowdfunding uh, where every individual that wants to join this network, again, it's member supported. So in addition to the relationship fees, members are joining, individuals are actually paying something to join this network, okay? When we open business registration this fall, businesses will pay to join the network. It will be a, a tiered, tiered fee by the, um, the size of the business based on revenue. <clears throat> so it's all about what we need to get to that button. Now there's a second core feature of the network, an early flagship feature that uh, is also the basis for the crowdfunding campaign that we're running. And that is on every one of these networks, you have an address. How many folks in this room Use Twitter. Show of hands? Okay. How many of you have become attached to that at name that you use on Twitter on a regular basis, okay? <clears throat> and how many of you stop to think, you don't actually own that address? Twitter does, okay? Again, that's, that's the way these, all of these networks have addresses. The Twitter address has become the best known. When you want to build a network that's all about people having individual sovereignty and control over their data, then you need an address that you control as an individual. That when you get it, you have it for life and you know it's portable to every service provider that you might want to use, okay? It's truly yours. Just like a Twitter uh, address starts with an at sign, with XDI it starts with an equal sign. <clears throat> but the whole infrastructure behind this, the technical infrastructure, the legal infrastructure, and the business model has been designed to support you having control of that. This is truly your identifier. This is what around, <clears throat> it's what, what we call it is the first permanent portable private digital ad address for life. And I wanna underscore private, okay? As Gary will tell you here very shortly when he speaks uh, for Newstar, yes, this is as much of an evolutionary step forward on the internet as the phone number was to the phone system or the email address was to the email network. But unlike both of those addresses, you'll never receive spam on an equals name. It is the address of your cloud and you control it. So everything will be by permission, okay? That's why this really is a revolutionary new form of address. <clears throat> Mine is, I actually have several, but this is the, the full one. That's another thing about a cloud name. You can have multiple and, and you control where they point. <clears throat> That's mine. We encourage you, as part of the, our, our global cloud funding, to go get yours. We actually call this campaign the Equals You campaign. This is what people, when they're coming uh, to register, and this is the new site that we just brought live here for Sydney. Um, we had a, a, a much broader site, and, and people said, I want to understand exactly what it is I'm doing when I'm just signing up for this network, what I'm getting with this cloud name, what I'm funding. So we created a new video that just went live last night which is basically me explaining this is what it means. It's a condensed version of this talk. <clears throat> and people can come, they can see exactly um, uh, how many folks are already part of the campaign, how much uh, has been raised, and you can start and register your cloud name right here. When you do that, you're starting the process here, but you're actually then picking one of the five cloud service providers around the world, one of which is here, uh, Brian Grimmer and, and the team at OneXus is gonna talk this afternoon about what it means to be a cloud service provider on this network. <clears throat> and then you will have your cloud name and what we call your baby cloud, right? Your, the very start of the cloud <clears throat> that you will start using as applications come out for the network. And the first one being that button that will begin to appear on websites this fall as business members join the network. So <clears throat> that's my quick summary. I hope I've, I've helped make it concrete. 
and now i'll take questions here.